manifesting the kingdom of God. I hope uh, we'll be running some slides so you can follow from there. But I have my work cut out here for me, so whatever you can follow, I hope you will. And I pray that the media team will just be able to go with me so that you die and don't go too fast or delay so that we're just together. Turn with me to the Bible in the book of Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. And I know here people read scripture corporately, so I want us to read together. <laughs> we must keep the culture of the house. All right. One, two, go. Uh-huh. 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 Mm -hmm. You sound like you didn't eat. You read, but it's not very nice. Can we read again? Okay, this time strong and powerful. Here is mom. Let us appreciate her coming. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Welcome. We honor you. We really honor you. Thank you so much. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Let's go again. One to read. Yeah. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Father, we thank you this evening for your grace. Thank you for the opening of our hearts and our minds to be able to understand your will for us in this season. Lord, as I stand here today, I'm humbled before you, and I pray that the multitude that sits here will receive something from your throne and from your heart. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say it. Amen. Now, um, this was very interesting because like everybody else, when you do not know something or understand, the right place to do is to begin by asking. And these Pharisees, you know, as much as they looked like they knew, they understood. And I'm sure when they asked Jesus, there's a certain expectation they had as far as what kind of answer he would give. And a very, very plain question, you know, the Bible says, you know, when the kingdom of God will come, they are asking, yes, and say, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. And remember, every time Jesus spoke to people, he spoke from a point of discernment and understanding their heart. He was not ignorant of what they were thinking or what they knew. He knew what they knew and what they were thinking. And so most likely, the Pharisees had a picture of a physical kingdom with certain manifestations that probably looked very much like the Roman Empire that was ruling then, of course, with the grandiose buildings and armies and, you know, power and pomp and all those kind of things. And Jesus, characteristic of his answers, he gave a hopelessly simplistic answer. And he just told them that, listen, this kingdom does not come by observation. In other words, is not something that you're going to see by staring with your naked eye. And he went on to tell them that you will not be able to say, see there, or here it is. But then he told them that actually this kingdom is already within you. The correct rendering there will be among you because there is no way the kingdom would have been in Pharisees because none of them had believed in him. So the correct biblical rendering for within you here in this translation is among you, not within, because the kingdom would only be within somebody that had already received Jesus Christ as a prophet of God and as a son of God at that particular point. Let me begin by saying that the kingdom of God, and I'm now going into my slides, also referred to as the kingdom of heaven. Every time you find the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of heaven, without complicating things, the actually one is a synonym of the other. One is the kingdom of heaven because it is ruled from heaven. Okay? But the kingdom of God, also referred to as the kingdom of heaven, is the rule and reign of God in the hearts and the affairs of men through Jesus Christ. Many people talk about the kingdom of God. 
but it is important to have this basic and baseline understanding that the kingdom of God is the rule and the reign of God in the hearts and the affairs of men through Jesus Christ. Now, there are a number of things there. When you talk about the rule, you're talking about instruction and regulation. Where there is rulership, we expect instruction and regulation and some kind of control so that things don't just work the way they want. There is a power, there is an authority, there is a command that is ensuring that things work the way they need to go. And then when you talk about the reign, the reign is simply supremacy, sovereignty, or control. So we are saying that every time we talk about manifesting the kingdom of God, we are saying that we are coming to a place whereby we want to see the rule, the instruction, the regulation, and the reign, which is the supremacy, the sovereignty, and the control of God in the hearts and the affairs of men. The place where the kingdom of God must come to is the hearts of men. And then from the hearts of men, the kingdom spills over to the things and the affairs of people. Let me tell you, friends, that's why Jesus Christ talked about the kingdom not being seen by observation. Because as far as he was concerned, you are not going to wait for something, you know, manifesting physically out there that looks grandiose and big and intimidating, but it is something, a work that begins in the heart of a human being. And that's why when Jesus Christ came, he targeted the hearts of people. Remember the preaching of John the Baptist? He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is a hand. Where does repentance take place from? Repentance takes place from the heart, because that is where Jesus Christ was targeting his supremacy and his reign in the hearts of God. It is important for me also to underscore that the kingdom of God is both present and future. In fact, it is important to say that the kingdom of God is both present, continuous, and it is also in the future. And you can see that from Scripture so that we get the right bearing as we get into how we can practically manifest the kingdom. In Luke chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus Christ, helping the people to understand what he was doing, he told them, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. In other words, he was saying, I am driving. He was saying if. It was not saying if because he wasn't, but he was arguing. So he produced the word if and he said, because I have driven demons using the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has already come to you. In other words, he was saying the kingdom is already here with you. But then when you read scripture again, you find there's a reference that tends to point out that the kingdom of God is also futuristic. And you find this again in Luke chapter 11, verse 2. He says, so he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, our Lord be your name, your kingdom come. Now, at one point, he says the kingdom is here, but in prayer, he also says, ask for the kingdom to come. So, it is here, but it also needs to come. So, it is in the future. Are you, that's simple. That's simple understanding, my friends. All right? So, it's important to have this basic understanding of the rendering of the kingdom because you cannot effectively manifest something that you don't understand. It is important that the church comes to a place whereby we know. When we talk about the kingdom, what are we really talking about? We are talking about the rule and the reign of God in the hearts first of all and then the affairs of men. And then we also know that this kingdom is already here, but it's a kingdom that is also coming. So there's an element of the kingdom that we already have, but there's an aspect of the kingdom that is yet to come after the fulfillment of all these things. Now let's get us to really what brought us here, because the theme of our conference is kingdom manifestation. This is a popular statement. We want to manifest the kingdom of God. And if there is anything the Pentecostal church likes, is manifestation. Don't we love manifestation? Anything that looks silent doesn't favor us. But anything that manifests, we love it. And that's why I love this theme, manifesting the kingdom. So how do we really manifest the kingdom of God? Now, the church has a responsibility to manifest the kingdom of God through faithful Christian living and witness. 
when we begin to think ourselves as the sons of God and the citizens of the kingdom, one of our core responsibilities of our lives as believers is to be able to show forth this kingdom through our Christian living and witness. And if there is any aspect that the church needs of necessity to focus on, it's actually the aspect of being able to manifest this kingdom through our Christian living and witness. Now, the simple understanding of the word manifest is to make clear, to make plain, evident, blatant, unmistakable, undeniable, explicit, noticeable, recognizable, and obvious to the eye or to the mind. So when we are asked to manifest the kingdom, all we are saying is, there's this kingdom that is evident or that is alive in the hearts and the affairs of men and women through Jesus Christ. But we have a responsibility to make it clear, to make it plain, to make it evident, to make it blatant, unmistakable, undeniable, explicit, noticeable, recognizable, and obvious to the eye or to the mind. There are two levels where kingdom manifestation is key. People need to see and people need to understand. And that's where the responsibility of the church is. And that's why I keep saying it is important that in conferences like this, we really applaud and appreciate spiritual thinking by our leaders when they come up with these kind of topics in conferences. There are many conferences you go and you look at the topic and you're wondering just where did this minister get this topic from? Because it has absolutely no bearing to the benefit and the profit of the kingdom of God and the children of God. Because it's absolutely something that you don't understand. When you start talking of explosions in conferences, who needs an explosion really in a conference? What is, are you exploding? And sometimes you look for that explosion and you can't see it. But when you talk about manifestation and we understand the basis of what we are manifesting, it is a powerful truth. And when we catch that, we all leave a conference with something that we can go and do and show that in the next conference there has been traction, there has been progress, there is movement as far as the body of Christ is concerned. So when we talk about manifesting the kingdom, we are saying that we are here to do something in our Christian witness, our Christian living, to make the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God in the hearts of men and women, plain, clear, evident, unmistakable, and all these other uh, synonyms that I've already given you for the sake of understanding. The message of the kingdom becomes credible when the church manifests the reality of kingdom life. Remember, our gospel is a gospel of the kingdom. But until it is manifested in practical ways where people can see and understand, our message becomes empty rhetoric and words. It doesn't make sense to onlookers and people that try to understand. That's why the church has a responsibility to come to the place where we really begin to ask ourselves, how can we practically manifest the kingdom of God so that the gospel can be rendered as credible? The first way that we can manifest this kingdom, believe it or not, is through the presence of Christ here on earth. The presence of Jesus Christ here on earth. You'll ask me, Pastor Malilin, Jesus was here more than 2,000 years ago. How do you talk about his presence here? Now, this is what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. I want you to notice that many times when you want to understand the expression of an idea, you go back to what we call the first principles. The first principles. What was mentioned in the beginning as far as what we are talking about is concerned. 
The Bible talks of someone who was spoken of by prophet Isaiah, John the Baptist, coming to talk about preparing the way for somebody who would come. And this person is none other than Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus came, John the Baptist was saying, for the kingdom of God is near. In other words, John was equating the presence of the kingdom with the presence and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you cannot talk about the kingdom without Jesus Christ. When you remove Jesus from the equation of the kingdom, it no longer becomes kingdom. Because before he came, the kingdom was something else. It was far removed. Otherwise, Jesus would never talk about the kingdom coming. It was far away removed from people in the Old Testament. But when he comes after the preaching of John and himself, then the kingdom is near. Then at some point, the kingdom is come. And then the kingdom is among you. Are you beginning to understand that? So, friend of necessity, we need to appreciate that as we build up, we see that when you want to think about manifesting the kingdom, the most easiest way to manifest the kingdom is to find a way of having the presence of Jesus somewhere. When you have Jesus, you don't struggle to manifest this kingdom. Stay with me. In Luke chapter 20, verse 17 to 19, where we read, now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, Hear or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, Jesus was saying, As I speak to you, the kingdom is standing right here with you. That's what he was simply saying. But remember, because of being tactical and wise, Jesus would not tell them, I am the kingdom because they would probably have hanged him before time. So he was very wise. And he's telling them, the kingdom is here. Now let's come home. Christ lives in the heart of every believer. Let's now stop going to the past. Let's come to the present. Each one of you that seated here, you have received the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have not, there will be a moment to do that. But it is important to understand that Christ lives in the heart of every believer. Luke chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible says, talking about, talking to some of the people that were around him, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him. And we, who are we? The father and Jesus. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus was saying, a time has come where when people allow us into their lives, I and my father will come and we live inside of them. I'm just trying to, you know, convince you, just in case you are not sure, that when you get born again, Jesus and father live inside of you. That's basic truth. <laughs> in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says to them who, those that he needed to show the mysteries of God, we would to make known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me try and make this a little straightforward. I've already told you the number one way of manifesting that kingdom is the presence of Jesus Christ here on earth. Where is Jesus today? Jesus is true, seated at the right hand of God, but he is also living in the heart of each and every believer. One of the ways the church can manifest the kingdom is to ensure that Jesus Christ is alive and kicking in the heart of every believer. The problem with this truth is, is not what the church wants to hear. The question is this. How alive is the Jesus in your heart? How much can the people that interact with you see of the Jesus that lives inside of your heart? Let us talk more. <laughs> 
When people look at you in the place of work, in business, in church, in school, how much of Christ can they measure out of you? If there was a Christometer that people would come putting inside your mouth, like the way they use thermometers, how much of Christ would be sensed in your life? Because that is the basis of the manifestation of the kingdom here on earth. Anything else is neither here nor there, my friends. And that's what we are running away from the, as a church. People don't want to be confronted with the fact that how much of the fruit of the Spirit can be found among believers. Joy, peace, patience, you know, hope and all these wonderful fruit of the Spirit. How much of self-control is found in you because of the Spirit of God that's living in you? Because remember, the kingdom of God is the rule and the reign of God in the hearts of men and women through Jesus. So when Jesus exemplifies himself through your life, then that is kingdom. But how do we want to show kingdom? We want to show kingdom by driving big cars. Even people without kingdom are better cars than us. That's a failure. We are not going that route. Thank God for cars. I really need one, by the way. I love this sanctuary. Sometimes I wish I was an assistant pastor here. Even if I don't preach, just to brag about our roof and our everything. And these lights I see until I, I just give up, you know. <laughs> Lovely. And this is good. But tell you what, heathens can do better things than this. In fact, if you look for technology, it's not in church. It is somewhere else. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have these things. We must have them. We must do everything to have the best. But this cannot be a measure of kingdom. We should never be deceived. The measure of the kingdom is not the price of suits we wear. Let's get back to the truth of the word of God. The kingdom of God is the level of measure of the influence of Jesus in your heart and in your affairs. And when you begin to see that, then we have the kingdom. How many of you still want to stay in the conference? Every believer is a walking manifestation of the kingdom of God. And I want to challenge you that after this conference, as you walk out of here, I want you to know that you are a piece of the manifestation of the kingdom of God, wherever you are. That where people meet you, they need to be able to see Jesus and to feel Jesus. Because at the introduction of the kingdom, the first statement was, repent for the kingdom of God He's come. And that has never changed. It remains. We need to strive and ask the Lord to help us to come to the place whereby when people meet us, when people interact with us, they have reason to ask us, why do you behave the way you behave? Until people begin to say you are different, the kingdom is silent. The kingdom is quiet. Manifesting the kingdom. One, the presence of Christ here on earth. Number two, following on that one, the power of Christ on earth. We have come with the presence, just the presence. But now we go to the second dimension, the power. Everybody say the power of Christ. The power of Christ here on earth. Luke chapter, well, I don't know. I don't know where those scriptures came from. I'm not sure they are mine. <laughs> Am I the one who gave you those? Yeah, I think so. They are somewhere down. Okay. Let's just look at the verse. I think I picked some and left others. We already saw this verse, Matthew 12, 12, 28, where he says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. What he was saying, because I have demonstrated power, that demonstration of power is a sign that the kingdom is here. So it's not enough to have Jesus in our hearts. We also need to allow him 
to demonstrate his power through us. And again, here comes a challenge. A lot of believers have fallen into this trap where we have assigned power operations to a small group of people we call ministers. To an extent that now we even have ministers who are specialized in dealing with certain levels of demons. It's absolutely nonsense. It's not biblical. There's no way in scripture where there's a classification of people that can deal with certain devils. Oh, that one? No, leave that, to, leave one, leave that one to bake. You just go deal with the demons of flu and the rest. But that one? No, no, no. The understanding is that Jesus Christ who lives in me is the same that lives in someone else. And the church needs to change the thinking. And, and this is a, a ploy to rob the church of its power. Let's assume that uh, I'm carrying, let, let's assume this is, let's say this is petrol. Okay? So I have a lot of petrol here. So I give Pastor Oscar some petrol, Pastor Albert, and the other ministers here. I give them a bit of it. What would be the difference in the chemical formulation of what I have and what I gave them? There will be no difference, isn't it? But it appears in the church we have come up with this erroneous philosophy that when Jesus gave his power to the ministers of the gospel and then they ministered to his people, it reduced in power. Such that unless... I appear in a place, there are certain things that won't happen. I agree, graces are different. And that, I agree. There are certain levels of grace, and that comes because of people's experience and walk with the Lord and the level of obedience. But if we would free ourselves and begin to realize that we are as much powerful as everybody else, this church of Jesus Christ would be a formidable force. But because of an erroneous thinking, we all walk weak, and we have to wait until we encounter one specialist. And you know the problem with specialists, normally there are very few. So if you have only one specialist who casts out demons in Umoja, it means all oh, the demons have to wait for this one specialist. The church is severely limited. The manifestation of the kingdom of God is completely curtailed. But suppose now all this group, we all move out of here and all of us are walking in understanding of power. My friend, tell me, what would happen to this region? That's the manifestation of the kingdom I'm talking about. And that's where we need to bring the church back to. Where we stop being a few specialists of us. Because we can't do the work. In Matthew 11, verse 1 to 6, now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of the disciples and said to him, Are you the one coming or are you the coming one or do we look for another? Listen to what Jesus said. Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. In other words, Jesus was telling John the Baptist that you announced that the kingdom is here now. What I'm talking about is the manifestation of that kingdom. So because you are talking of the one to come, I don't need to say I'm the one to come. I'm going to tell you by what has happened since I came. Friend, what has happened since Jesus came into your life? What has happened? If somebody asks you, are you born again or do you have Christ in your heart? Are you able to enumerate certain power demonstrations? that say that Christ lives in your life? Has your life been changed? Because it's not just about casting out devils. We require the power of God to change lives. 
I wasn't a very bad young man, but when I got saved, I'm told some of my classmates wanted to come and really testify that I had been saved. And I wondered whether I was that bad. It means the power of God did something in my life, isn't it? At least I, took, I look at it positively. But can you say that there's been a power encounter in your life? Because one of the ways we can manifest the kingdom of God is through the demonstration of power. Listen to me, friends. The demonstration of the power of God and not really necessarily material wealth is a sign that the might of the kingdom of God is present here on earth. Why do I say that? Look at how Jesus sent his disciples. He actually did not even... Do you notice that Jesus never funded the disciples from his treasury when they were going for ministry? <laughs> he even told them not to carry anything. How do you do that? This is a new kingdom. Nobody knows you. You have no supplies and you are just told to go. And he told them, go. And he said, where you go, you will be supplied. But today, try to send anyone for mission. Na bus fare. Na tutakula nini, bishop? Now, I'm not saying we are planning to starve any of you. No, no, no. Things have changed, I know. <laughs> the gospel requires money to preach. <laughs> you cannot hang things like this if you don't have money, can you? I was just asking Pastor Albert, can we have that? He told me the price. I told him, let's wait until we are 50 years. We shall hang them. <laughs> and we need money. But the point is, friends, that we need to focus where it matters most. Jesus instructed them to demonstrate the power of the kingdom. We need to demonstrate the power of the kingdom. My friend, when your neighbor calls you at night to take their child to hospital, it's okay, be available, provide the car, but as you drive, tell them, let me lay hands on this baby. Don't say, let's call the pastor, let him pray, and I'll put the phone on the car. As if, No, 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 no. You pray. Because Jesus is inside of you, and you have the power of God in your life. That's how we are going to manifest this kingdom. In Luke 9, 1 to 2, he said, Then he called his 12 disciples together, gave them the power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Power demonstration. That is basic stuff that we need to go back to. Jesus delegates the power of his kingdom to the apostles and also to every member of the church because after he sent the 12, he also sent the 72 representing the larger proportion of us. And every one of you is capable of moving in that power in the name of Jesus when you understand that he lives in you. So manifesting the kingdom, one, the presence of Christ on earth. Number two, the power of Christ on earth. Number three, righteousness, peace, and joy. That's the other way that we can manifest the kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Romans 14, 14 to 16. I, now, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's amazing how the Apostle Paul starts by talking about how we need to behave towards one another. I, I'm sure by now you know 
that the whole economics of God and relationship is that, first of all, we have a relationship with God the Father, of course, through Jesus, and then we have this relationship one with another, either with people who are not born again or with one another who are born again. Basically, that's the whole economics of relationship as far as God is concerned. And God is so concerned that even when you look at the commandments, a portion of them have to do with the relationship with him and the rest have to do with one another. And when you read scripture, you find that a lot of things that have to do with our manifestation of Christ in our hearts has to do with our relationship. If you look at the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, you know, um, patience, uh, forbearance, uh, and all these, they have something to do with one another. Forbearance means because you're going to delay me, I need to be patient. Yet it's a fruit of the Spirit. So you begin to realize that the Apostle Paul begins to explain that, yes, there are certain things you can do. You can eat meat, you can eat food. But then he said, do not destroy the one who Christ died for because of your food, because Christ died for this one. Now, he says, do not let your good be spoken of evil by other people because the kingdom of God is not just about food and drinking and all these other things we value so much. It's about righteousness. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So how do we manifest the kingdom? Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. I know we, saw, we sang that song, but we never sat down to think, what does this singer say? That's the kingdom of God. And yet, when it comes to manifesting kingdom, we are looking for all these grandiose things, and the Bible is bringing us back to the simple matters of faith. How are you relating with other people? How is your conduct? How sensitive are you to your brother and your sister? What things are you saying in their hearing? That's kingdom. Because when you mess around there, you deny people righteousness, joy, and peace. And that's kingdom. Hey, hey. See, this preacher today is sounding very different. Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost are born out of a mutually beneficial, Christ-centered relationships. Let me tell you, friends, if you want to live a life of righteousness, because the things that make us unrighteous many times have something to do with how we relate one with another. But when our relationships are Christ-centered, that we relate out of the fear of God, out of the love of Jesus, doing things for one another because Jesus lives in our hearts, then we are in the kingdom. And that's what makes a church thrive. That's what makes a church powerful because the power of God is not being hindered because of poor and breaking of relationships among his brethren. Today, we have to fight so hard as ministers to reconcile this brother with this one, this sister with this other one. You know, when this sister sees that one going that way, she goes this way. And yet we are worshiping in the same church. These are simple things, but we must deal with them. Otherwise, they become a hindrance to the power and the manifestation of the King of God. In conclusion, because I can see my time is dwindling, Christians must take responsibility to reflect the image and character of Christ by allowing the fruit of the Spirit to flow to others. Can you just put for me Galatians 5.22? Because I need us to read that together. One, two, let's read. But the fruit of the Spirit, are we reading together? One, two, go. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Okay. Self-control. And against such, there is not. There is no law. So, we must take responsibility to reflect the image and the character of Christ. Believe it or not, if you can be able to reflect the joy of the Spirit, people, I mean, the fruit of the Spirit, nobody will ever ask you whether you, I mean, nobody will ever doubt your salvation. You don't even need to tell people I'm born again. Can I give you a short story? I don't know if I've given it here before. I'll try to summarize it because I have a few minutes. One time, I think it's in 2011 January, I, was, I needed to fly to Johannesburg with our two boys. And when we came to the airport, there had been a problem with the lighting. So landing and taking off planes had been delayed for 12 hours. A lot of chaos. 
And so we come this morning and I'm, I get my ticket and the boys, and obviously you know, you want to sit with your family. And so when I get into the plane, I, f- I realize that our firstborn is seated like in the third row, then the, the, the younger one is seated next year, and I have no seat. <laughs> so, so I get in the plane, it is full, and I have no seat, and I'm just standing there. So I stand there for a few minutes, and one of the cabin crew ladies comes and takes my, she asks me, why are you standing? I say, well, I have no seat. And where is your boarding pass? It's here. So I gave it to her, and she went away for 20 good minutes, and I stood there waiting. So she came, sorted out things. I was able to sit with a younger man because he needs some support in some things. And so we took off. So as we take off, there's a level where when the plane now levels, everybody sobers up. I don't know why. If you have flown, you know that. So this elderly man sitting next to me looks at me and says, Sir, can I talk to you? I said, Absolutely, yes. And he looks at me and he says, I'm going to ask you a question and please forgive me for this. I asked him, What did he say? You know, I watched you here for the last almost 20 minutes. You came in, you were inconvenienced, uh, you had, I'm sure you had paid for your flight and everything, but this girl came, took your boarding pass, went out 20 minutes, no one spoke to you, and you stood here, you were calm, you didn't shout, you didn't sweat. <laughs> so he asked me, so have you been trained to be this way or were you born this way? Now, I know that sounds very obvious, but I don't know what he saw. And for me, that took me aback because I wasn't even conscious that that's how I behaved. Well, and I quickly thought, I said, well, what, what a question. So I told him, well, one, of course, I, I wasn't born this way because really no one is born this way. But the reality is, even if I yelled and screamed and I had blood pressure, that wouldn't have solved the problem. So either way, they were going to give me a seat or flood me, I go home and I have a place to go. So that's not an issue. I would have gone home. But I told him, but most importantly, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. And I'm born again. I'm a minister of the gospel. Wow. And he began to open his heart. He told me, you know, I wish you could meet my daughter. She lives in Germany, but she's big-headed. I really wish you can pray for. And she talked many things. Of course, I prayed for the daughter. I hope she's well today. But what am I trying to say? I'm not saying I'm the best of this. Once in a while, I blew up. I blow up, eh? I do. But you can imagine the message, just a simple fruit of patience delivered to this man. So you can imagine. Can you, can you get that verse again there, please? Can we just mention the fruit? One, love. Uh-huh. 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 Mm-hmm. Next. And... I'm telling you, if there is a way we can allow the fruit of the Spirit to just begin to show up, there is no other kingdom manifestation people are looking for. That is what is lacking in the whole world. Everything killing people can be solved by that simple verse right there. Christ reigning in the hearts and the affairs of men. We need to possess strong core values and convictions based upon the standards of God was, and these include integrity, discipline, trustworthiness, faithfulness, dependability, honesty, wisdom, and victorious attitude. If we carry that where we are, friends, the kingdom will be seen by the people that are looking at us. This way we begin to affect and influence the lives of others in a beneficial and a lasting way. We must bring Positive change in every sphere of influence, environment, and system as we exemplify the character, standards, and values of Christ in our business affairs, on our jobs, in our homes, churches, and communities. And since God is invisible, people should be able to see him in our deeds, in our words, and our attitudes. Since the kingdom is invisible, it has to be made visible through our deeds, our words, our attitudes, and our deeds. And this will be the most vivid manifestation of the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this day. We surrender our hearts to you. And we pray that the reality of the rule and the reign of Christ in our hearts and our affairs will be evident. Help us, Lord, to be able to demonstrate your kingdom in the way that you intended it. To the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say it. God bless you.